Tim Tim plays for days in the maze and there's a minute tall tall tiny minute tall tall little minute tall tall mini minute tall tall minute tall tall tiny minute tall tall little minute tall tall mini minute tall tall cute little tiny little minute tall sitting in a cradle he thinks that maybe it's a baby but it may be more of a tiny minute tall if you have I'll do okay if you haven't figured it out by now I think of history as a story and so today I'm going to start with two stories and the second story actually has a couple of chapters. So every good story begins with once upon a time. And once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess, which of course is redundant because every princess is beautiful. And she lived in a part of the world that we know as Phoenicia. And her name was Europa. And one day the god Zeus saw her and fell in love with her or lust with her because we know that Zeus, you know, he came, he saw, he fell in love with everybody. And he was the king of the gods. And he decides to appear to her, and I'm not sure why, but he decides to appear to her in the form of a beautiful white bull. So as Europa and her friends are walking along the seashore, this white bull comes out of the sea. And of course, there's originally the screaming, ah, 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 ah. but then they become really intrigued and the bull is very friendly and they pet him and um, they put flowers on his horns and he cuddles for his bull, he's pretty friendly. And finally Europa is really tempted and she gets on the back of the bull and he swims away. And he swims and he swims and he swims and he ends up on the island of Crete. So Zeus has, okay, let me get back. Zeus has started over here in uh, Phoenicia and he swims all the way over to the island of Crete. Crete is where he was born. And he was born in supposedly in this cave that you can go and visit. Now, he and Europa actually spend time together. Um, she has three sons with Zeus, but then his eye catches somebody else and he appears in another form, whether it's a swan or something else, you know, Zeus does that. And he leaves Europa there with the three kids, the three little boys, um, and then she then marries the king of Crete. And the king of Crete says, your sons will be my heir and her eldest son is going to be the heir. Now this eldest son is gonna be half God. Now, if you haven't already guessed it, it's because of Europa that we have Europe. That's where Europe gets its name from. It comes from, the, from this Phoenician princess who was seduced by Zeus. So we have this king and he becomes known as King Minos. Um, and actually more and more historians today are thinking that Minos actually may have been a title rather than a name, but we have this, this king. Um, he is half God. Um, he gets married, he has children, and he, he actually has a pretty good relationship with his dad and he consults Zeus if there's a really serious problem. But because of the location of Crete, he also is very, wants to say very friendly with his uncle Poseidon. Poseidon is the god of the sea. Well, Crete is an island. And so he frequently makes really nice with uncle Poseidon. It's like if you had an uncle who won the lottery um, and got a gazillion dollars, you'd probably be pretty nice to that uncle, just in case. So he, he goes to um, his uncle Poseidon and says, you know, I want to honor you. And uncle Poseidon says, well, I need a sacrifice. And um, so uncle Poseidon sends a bull 
out of the sea. Um, and that bull, he says, that is going to be the sacrifice. So in a sacrifice, um, we see this in a lot of early religions. You, you have an animal, you kill the animal, and you feed the people with the animal, lots of sacrificial animals. In this, in this case, it's a bull. So obviously bulls are pretty important and you can think about the, the masculinity aspect of all of this. Well, this bull that comes out of the sea for, to Minos from um, Uncle um, Poseidon is gorgeous. It's wonderful. It's like the most perfect bull you could imagine. And Minos and his wife talk about this and they say, you know, a bull is a bull is a bull is a bull is a bull. And maybe we'll keep this one because he would be a great father to future cows and calves and bulls. And we'll sacrifice our other bull. And that's what they do. The only problem is that that does not make Uncle Poseidon really happy. That's somewhat like your rich uncle who won the, the, the lottery giving you, I don't know, the money to buy a really expensive Rolex and you go to the store and you look and you buy a Timex instead uh, and keep the rest of the money for yourself. So Uncle Poseidon gets really angry. And when Poseidon gets, you don't want to get gods angry. They really are not good when they're angry. And so, um, he decides he's going to punish this family. And what he does is he puts a curse on a multi-level curse on Minos and, and his wife. His wife's name is Pasiphae. Uh, it's just easier to call her Mrs. Minos. And the curse is that Mrs. Minos is going to fall madly in love with the bull. And she is not going to be satisfied or happy until she has sex with the bull. <sighs> you can just imagine what a great, this. Like, so anyway, so it is curse. Now it happens that on the island of Crete, they had this guy whose name was Daedalus and he was an engineer. And she goes to him and she, she begs him to help her because um, she's nothing. She can't eat, she can't sleep, she can't do anything. And Daedalus figures out a system and I don't want to know what it is. He figures out a system so she can have sex with a bull. As soon as she does, the, that part of the curse is broken. She's horrified, and she's even more horrified to find out that she's pregnant. And she gives birth to the Minotaur. And the Minotaur is half man, half bull. And the second part of the curse is if something happens to the Minotaur, Minos' kingdom will be destroyed. They have to keep this beast alive. So they're stuck. They, they don't want people to know about this. This is, you know, talk about a family secret. And so they go to Daedalus again and they say, Daedalus, you know, do something, do something. And Daedalus does, he creates a maze, a labyrinth. And they put the Minotaur in the middle of it. They're gonna feed it, they're gonna keep it alive, but they're gonna keep it secret from absolutely everybody. And so, um, but then you got to worry about Daedalus. And so they lock Daedalus and his son, who was his helper, up in a tower. Um, they provide food for him, but he can't get out. They want to keep him prisoner because he's the only one who knows their secret. Okay, the birth of the Minotaur. Meanwhile, while this is all going on, Androgeos, who's the son of Minos, goes out on an adventure because that's what you do when you're a young man and he ends up in Athens and there's an athletic competition. Now this young man, Androgeos, is one quarter god. So he's got superpowers, you know, talk about, you know, Superman and he's incredibly handsome. He wins every athletic competition. All the girls fall in love with him. All the guys in Athens are really jealous. Uh, they don't know who this stranger is. This guy's just appeared. He's winning the prizes. He's winning the women. And so they gang together and they kill him. And when Minos finds out, he is not happy about it. Um, and 
He talks to his father and says, you know, hey, Zeus, your grandson got killed. And Zeus says, oh, we're going to get those Athenians. And Zeus says, go for them. And in response to this prayer, Zeus sends the plague and famine. And then the Athenians sacrifice people. And we go back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately, the Athenians learn that they have to pay tribute to Minos. And what Minos does is say, then say, send seven young men and seven young women. These are probably people in their mid-teens every year to Crete or every seven years or every nine years, different versions of the stories have different amounts of time. And they are going to be fed to the Minotaur because you, you don't want to feed the people of Crete to the Minotaur. You got to feed some strangers. So the Athenians are sending their brightest and their best because uh, you know we don't want the old and the sick and the ugly. We want the best, the best. And they go to uh, be eaten by the Minotaur. So, it happens that the king of Athens, by the luck of the draw, his son Theseus um, ends up being one of the people to go to be fed to the Minotaur. Now, they didn't have binge watching TV, they didn't have Netflix, they didn't have um, you know, 24 hour television. And so the gods and goddesses used to sit around and, and you know, watch humans. And, you know, oh, what's happening? And sometimes they would interfere. It's like voting on, um, you know, some sort of talent show um, and um, the voice or dancing with the stars or whatever, you get to call in and vote. Well, um, it happened that, um, that um, Eros or Cupid decides to get involved. And so he sends an arrow and that arrow hits Ariadne. And when you get hit with Cupid's arrow, you fall in love with the first person you see and Ariadne falls madly and passionately in love with Theseus. Only problem is that Ariadne is the daughter of Minos and Mrs. Minos. So she's a princess of, the, of Crete. And, you know, she goes to Theseus, I love you, I love you, love you. And he says, well, I'm going to be killed by the Minotaur. Um, she says, I'll save you, I'll save you. And so she drugs the guards. She unlocks the prison cell that Theseus is in. She frees all the other Athenians. And she gives Theseus a sword and a ball of twine. And he finds his way into the middle of the maze. She gives him some secrets about the Minotaur. She, he finds his way into the middle of the maze or the labyrinth. He kills the Minotaur. And he, because he's fastened the string to the doorway of um, this maze, he then follows the string out. He grabs Ariadne um, and goes down to the harbor. His fellow Athenians have uh, sabotaged all the ships in the harbor except theirs. They've drilled holes in the bottom of them and um, they take off and they sail out of the harbor and eventually they come to an island where they have to um, to rest and they rest on the island of Naxos and the next day they take off and they leave Ariadne behind because she served her purpose um, and there's different versions of what happened to Ariadne one says that she realizes that she's caused the destruction of her home and her family's kingdom, and she commits suicide. She hangs herself. Another says the god Dionysus finds her and marries her, and she, they live happily ever after. But then a variant of that is that Dionysus um, orders her to be killed by Artemis. We're just going to leave Ariadne. You can decide for yourself what happened to her. Theseus heads back to Athens, <clears throat> but he forgets that a little instruction that had been given to him by his father, who was the king of Athens, King Aegis. And King Aegis said, um, we're sending this ship down to Crete with a black sail, black because we're sad, we're in mourning. Theseus had told his father, I'm gonna kill the Minotaur, I'll come back, we'll never have to do this again. His father said, if you are successful, change the sail to white. And Theseus forgets 
I personally think it was deliberate. You may not. I don't really like feces very much. But anyway, Theseus comes back. He hasn't changed the sail. It's still black. His father is waiting uh, up on top of the cliff, looking out to sea, you know, my son, my son. And he sees the ship returning with the black sail. And he just goes, jumps right into the water and becomes, the water becomes known as the Aegean Sea because of him. Um, Theseus then lands and immediately becomes king of Athens and goes on to have a number of adventures. So we have Athens up here, we have the Minotaur down here, we have Ariadne dumped somewhere over here, and all of these places here are places where Theseus has other adventures, and, uh, but he's really not the subject of our story. Okay, first story. Second story. Uh, in the late to late 1900s, a German by the name of Schliemann said that Greek myths and stories, such as what I've just told you, are not just fiction. He said the Iliad and the Odyssey are based on truth somewhere, there's facts. And he first begins to look for Troy. And he excavates in Turkey and he finds the site of an ancient city and lots and lots of treasures. And this is a picture of his wife wearing a headdress and a necklace that he excavated what in what he said was Troy. And here is this, some of these jewels, not too shabby, that is gold. Um, this is as it was in the um, museum in um, uh, Germany. Schliemann sh um, smuggled all of this, these valuables out of Turkey um, the rumor is that he used it and smuggled them in his wife's underwear because he knew that the customs officials wouldn't go through the underwear that closely. It went on display in London and then it moved to Berlin. Schliemann did pay the Turks uh, who wanted the treasure back. He did buy it. During World War II, the Russians looted this German museum. And all of these treasures are now in Russia. They are locked in vaults and the Russians refuse to return them. They say it's their payment for um, uh, the damage that they went through in World War uh, II because of the Germans. Uh, the Germans are saying, hey, Schliemann gave them to the museum and he paid the Turks for them. The Turks are saying, hey, they should come back here because they belong in Turkey. Uh, so right now they're just in a basement and we can only see them in photographs. He then goes over to, in Troy, he's looking for the uh, Iliad. He then goes over to mainland Greece to a site called Mycenae, which is where the Greeks who left to attack Troy had come from. And he begins to excavate there, coming up with a gold cups, a gold diagram, gold masks. There's lots of questions about Schliemann's, how Schliemann, um, uh, when about this, whether he's a real archaeologist or whether he's a showman, uh, whether he faked things, I don't really know, but he did get us looking at all of this. And so here is Mycenae, here's Crete, here is Mycenae, here is Troy. And he becomes, he hears about um, somebody down here on Crete who was using a pickaxe to dig into a hill and found a group of store, storerooms filled with huge jars. But the Turkish government said, no, 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 you can't do this. And Schliemann becomes really interested and he makes arrangements to buy the land where this guy had been working with the pickaxe. And, but he was told that there were uh, 2,500 olive trees on the property. And when he counted, he only found 889. And so as far as he was concerned, the deal was off. And so Schliemann, the German, sticks with Troy and Mycenae. But then there was an Englishman and his name was Arthur Evans. And Arthur Evans arrives He's in his early 40s. He comes in 1894. He was educated in Oxford. He was the head of a museum. 
He had a passion for archaeology and ancient writing, and he begins to buy the site. But it's a mess. And on top of this, the C people of Crete are fighting for their independence from Turkey. And it's not until 1900 that things calm down enough that Hev Evans was able to buy the land he wanted to buy and do what he wanted to do, excavate. So here we have Arthur Evans. Within five days of starting to dig, he knows he has a building that is older than the Mycenaeans, and the Mycenaeans are dated to 3,000 years ago. Within seven days, he has clay tablets with writing on them. In less than a month, he found what is known as the oldest throne in Europe, and this is, the, this is right here, um, and he calls it the throne of Minos. He names these people the Minoans. In the year one, he, at the end of his first year of digging, he has uncovered an entire West Wing. Um, by the end of the third season, he's uncovered this huge palace, and then he begins to look for what's around it. The work stops for, in World War I. It begins again in 1922, in which in he was more than 70 years old, so there's help for all of us. And Evan says the people who built this palace were the Minoans. We don't know what they call themselves. And much of what Evans did reconstructed, he was he dug and then he reconstructed, not repaired. And they thought that people think that he didn't stick to the facts, and so he's been in criticism. But the palace becomes the focus, but it's not the first settlement on the site. There's 10 different levels of inhabitation underneath it, from the first semi-permanent homes to towns, and later on a city which was centered around a palace. And you can see here, this is one of the storage rooms, and you can see the size of these clay pots. These are clay, um, and they were used to store wheat, barley, olive oil, wine, so we question what he did. This is a reconstruction based on what he thought things looked like. But for now, I want you to just sit back and relax a little bit. Um, take a seat on this bench. This bench is about 4,000 years old. It is built along a road in a town. Um, and this is very common. The Minoans did things like this. This was built about the time, this bench dates back to about the time of the Great Pyramids. So, Knossos um, is the name we give to this palace. It's on the island of Crete. The island of Crete is in the, the center of the Eastern Mediterranean. It's at the crossroads of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Got Asia over here. Uh, just by its locations. First of all, to get there, you had to be a seafarer. They, they are very good at sailing and they become a, uh, a link between these three areas of the world. Uh, at its, um, it's 120 miles long and it's between 10 and 40 miles uh, from north to south. And it's 10 miles at its narrowest point, 40 miles at its, at its um, uh, widest point. Every place that you see a dot here um, is a, a known Minoan site. And we have a number of palaces. Um, Knossos is the biggest and the most famous, but there are others as well. The landscape of Crete has tall, rugged mountains. It has gentle valleys. It has plateaus. Uh, it is surrounded by the sea. There's lots of fish. It's great farmland. Um, you can see the, the um, and, and because of the mountains, there are a lot of natural resources, uh, uh, metals were there. Um, the climate of Crete is temperate. The winters are short and mild. And not, not unlike maybe South Carolina, um, for them, rarely gets below freezing. Um, it is hot in the summer. It is dry, but it, it's hot. Um, the land is very fertile, and they're able, they were able to produce enough food 
for to support everyone on the island, but they also were able to export some of it. Today, we don't have a lot of forest on the island, but at one point it was heavily forested um, and they exported food, the cypress wood, wine, um, uh, grapes, um, olive oil, wool, cloth, purple dye. They had um, ivory, uh, silver, gold, raw materials. These are olive trees, of course. And olives becomes one of the most important products of um, the early civilization here. And olives, olive oil was used for lighting. It was used for cooking. It was used for skin uh, lotion. Um, it was the all-purpose beauty product. Uh, every time I go to Greece, I swipe all the soap I can from the hotels because this soap is olive oil soap. And I can buy olive oil soap here, but it's not the same. Um, I've got dry skin and the olive oil soap that they have there is just magnificent for skin. The Minoans, um, or whatever, you know, would we call them that because that's what Arthur Evans called them. The people who lived here were significant uh, trading power um, and they had contact with all the major civilization. We know that they got, they had trade with places as far away as Spain, um, Egypt, the Middle East, mainland Greece. They developed unique art forms, including pottery. These are my two favorite pieces of pottery. I love the face of that octopus. Um, it's just such a friendly little octopus there um, that you've got. And this, I always called this the Super Bowl picture because this will kind of look like footballs here. Um, but these, and I don't know what you know about art and I can't describe it terribly well. But what I see when I look at the art of these people is lots of curvy lines, um, which is very gentle, very peaceful. Um, we have these huge jars and these are probably four and a half to five feet tall and they would be filled um, with excess. Um, and we have these handles here that you could put probably wood, uh, wooden poles through, and that people could carry them, lift them and carry them. Um, and, but this is storage and yet they are beautiful. They become really good at making gold jewelry. And we begin to see certain images over and over and over again, um, particularly this ax head, okay? Um, but, um, so we've, we've got wonderful jewelry. Um, we know that their ships were made out of the cypress trees. Their ships were probably more than 50 feet long. Um, they had sails on them, but they also had oars. Um, and, um, they traveled the Mediterranean in these ships. And all the evidence that we have, mostly from murals and, um, uh, pictures on pottery shows that they are trading ships, no warships. We don't find lots of militaristic types of depictions. Um, we don't see, um, we see a gentleness when we look at these people uh, in their artwork and their murals. We see this, um, that it's a peaceful society. There are a number of sites that are important besides Gnosis. And one of the things that's interesting about all of these is none of them have walls. None of them are walled cities. And, and walls tell you something. If you look at uh, when, we, when we talked about the Middle East um, and we talked about Mesopotamia, we had walled cities with big, strong walls. Well, none of these sites are walled which means they're not afraid of someone attacking them. We find no weapons. And when we do archeological work, we find some, some things that are, might, you might say, well, that's a weapon, that's a weapon, but it's not made of material that could actually sort of harm you. Um, if you have a sword out of gold, that's not gonna do a whole lot of damage to somebody um, because of gold is too soft. Um, 
We know that Zagros, Cato Zagro, on the eastern end of the island, is not, did not have really good farmland, but it has a wonderful harbor, and it now looks like that it's some sort of administrative center. It's a place where trade came through that harbor. Um, it's kind of like the New York and the Los Angeles, um, even Charleston, where what was the equivalent of container ships uh, 4,000 years ago came in through there. They have a palace there with a central courtyard. Um, and um, most of the town has not been excavated. It's still very new. But some of the houses that we have excavated may have had as many as 30 rooms. I mean, this is a big house. And the other thing we don't see when we look at these houses is although we may see a palace, and that's probably the wrong term, um, because it's not just a place where people lived, it was a, polit it was a political center, a religious center. Uh, it's kind of like the mall, the White House, Congress, uh, all put together. Um, and, um, but we don't see houses, don't, we haven't found houses that we say, oh, this is where a real poor person lived. Um, these towns were planned. Um, the houses were generally were multi-storied, at least two, sometimes three. Festos down here on the south side of the island um, has the second largest palace in size to Knossos. It is also built around a central courtyard and they were all built on terraces. So these, these palaces were on multiple levels. So here's looking at an aerial view of Knossos. Um, it covers six acres. It has 1,300 interconnecting rooms. All of the palaces seem to be oriented north-south and the living areas, this is the south is on the bottom of the screen. The living areas are here. We have a central courtyard. Some of this is, is, they've been doing some excavation, so some of this is covered. No, here's the central courtyard. Here's the central courtyard. This is an area of storage. This is an area where we have seem to have religious buildings. This area over here seems to be workshop areas. So we've got living areas, storage areas, government and religious areas, and workshop areas. Um, and so we have this large courtyard in the center. This is a, a plan, um, you know, it kind of, I hope that when you look at it, you go, oh, that looks like kind of a maze. Um, you know, we have this central courtyard. Um, we have the western part, which seems to be more sacred. Um, the courtyard itself is um, about, um, okay, this is from here to here is about the width of a football field. Um, this whole area is about, if you think in terms of a football field, it is the end zone to the 25 yard line. Okay, end zone to 25 yard line. It is paved with flagstone and was probably the site of religious ceremonies. Now this is an artist's depiction of what they think um, this looked like. And again, we call it a palace, but it's much more than that. Here we have the central courtyard. Here we have workshop areas. Here we have living areas, uh, storage, religious and government areas. Uh, this is kind of downtown all put together. Here's another view, artist's view of this area. And this is a road. This is a road that connected Knossos to the harbor. Today it's a fair distance from the harbor, but the harbor has silted up. Um, some people claim that this is the oldest paved road in Europe. It dates back more than 4,000 years. So here's the road. And this is a kind of an open area where there was kind of a one of several amphitheaters that they had. Um, and the road brings you to the palace entrance, which is a great, huge room. Um, and um, from this room where you would be greeted, you climb up a ramp. The ramp goes right up behind these pillars. You climb up a ramp 
and you enter into the courtyard. So this is about as militaristic as it comes. This is the road, you come up from the harbor, you come up this road, and so you have this level above you where I suppose people could drop stuff down on you. You can only go through, um, maybe in ancient times people were a little uh, more skinnier, narrower. Um, this is sort of a one and a half person width passageway. Um, maybe you could fit two people in side by side. But today, you pretty much go up this ramp single file, um, a little bit offset. If you had a child, the child could be next to you. Um, so that's about as, as militaristic as you get here. Now, again, a lot of this is, um, you, you definitely see the stone. This is concrete. This is concrete. Um, some of these are, are reproductions, um, reconstructions by Evans. But when he came into this throne room, the throne was the first room off the courtyard. We call it the throne room. It probably was a religious room. Um, and a lot of questions as to whether or not it was for a priestess. It's a lot of questions about whether or not this was a matriarchal society. It's hard to tell. This stone throne, this is original. It dates back more than 4,000 years. This bench is original, bench that goes around the side. This bowl was here. It's also more than 4,000 years old. It was not in this location. They've moved it um, um, from an area where you can look, but you can't go in and, and can't see it very closely. This floor is, again, 4,000 years old. Now, the wall. This is reproduction, and, but we know there was a fresco because the, the walls of this, the, of this house, this structure, um, there's wood and plaster, and of course decays over time, the wall collapses, the mud, there's mud brick, and so the plaster falls off the wall and on the ground, and it's a giant jigsaw puzzle. And they're pretty sure that this is the, both the colors that they used and the kinds of things. Now, is he absolutely right? Not really sure, but pretty close that this is what this room would have looked like. So here's a case of, this is a picture when they're just starting to reconstruct this column. This column is reproduction. Um, reconstruction. But this is what he found. These stones, these steps, he found that. None of that is rebuilt. Today, this, this is an artist's view of what it might have looked like. This is what you actually see today. And the, that throne room that I showed you is down in here. And you can see here we've got level, two levels, and maybe three levels up here. This is one of the um, 18 storerooms that they have with these large pithoi. Um, one of the things I always thought was neat is that these were additional hiding places. There were flagstones that went across here. And we see evidence that people put valuables in here, gold, silver, precious metals, things like that. And then you could put the flagstone over it and then move the pithoi on top. So nobody would know where your valuables were. It's like a safe in the floor again, 4,000 years ago. This is an artist's view of what the southern entrance would have looked like. And you'll see that it was the palace is built up on top of the hill. This would have been the courtyard level, another level up above it. And you can see maybe two more levels, but you also have levels that go down the hill as well. Um, the, uh, this is away from the harbor. Uh, they're, begin they're beginning to think that maybe this was some sort of religious ceremonial um, uh, entrance. We don't really know. We've got lots of questions. So one of the things that Evans found when he first began to excavate in 1900 was a staircase. And um, this is, he did have to rebuild a couple of early steps, but 
basically when you walk down this staircase, you were walking down steps that somebody walked down 4,000 years ago. And he can tell, you're gonna see that the columns, the columns are all uh, reproductions because they were originally wood. Um, and you're gonna say, here's a column, you can see one down here they've stuck in. Um, they're narrower at the bottom than they are at the top. And we know this because we have the holes where the base of the column fit into, and we have the, the um, um, capital with the hole that it would have fit into. And in the capital, the hole is bigger than it is at the base. So here you have these columns going down, um, and the staircase is built around a light well, which would bring light down to the lower levels. Okay, so as you go down here, these are the original steps, um, which is pretty kind of amazing when you think about that and you walk down that and you go, oh, oh, I'm, I'm really in contact with the past. This is about the only militaristic things I could find when I was at Gnosis. Um, and there's some question, these are shields. Um, and um, there's some question about whether or not this may have been painted on afterwards. But what you see with this, um, these frescoes which have been reconstructed, you can see the kinds of art forms, the, the I know not the technical term, the swirlies, the flowers, the gentle sort of curves. These are the colors that they use, the butterscotches and the, the, the reds and the, the blues. Um, and so here's the, the grand staircase and they take you down two levels to what seem to be living areas. Now, these would face south which means in the winter time, the sun would come in. And in the summertime, when it's really hot, you would have the light from the sun, but you wouldn't have direct sun coming into those rooms. One of the rooms is um, the Hall of the Double Axe. And Evans found a mass of lime from the walls against the north wall. And in the lime was the cast of a large wooden object. Lime will preserve things and the, the wood will disintegrate, but the lime has formed around the wood. And what he believes and what we kind of agree with him on is that this was the remains of a throne, very much like the throne that was in that throne room, except that was of stone and this was of wood. There is evidence, this is a huge room, it's called the House, the Hall of the Double Axe, and this huge room, and there's evidence that these could be closed off by doors, that there were wooden doors in here at some point, that the room could be made smaller, they could have partitions. The most fascinating room, though, is the Queen's Chamber, which is known for its frescoes. These are um, uh, replicas. The originals are in the museum in town and you can see them. Um, but what's interesting is what's back in here. Because what's, okay, here's a close up of the frescoes of little friendly dolphins. Um, and what we think the room may have looked like. But here's the queen's room, the Megaron, and we've got some light wells. But look at what we have here. We have a bathroom because we actually have a bathtub. Okay, again, 4,000 years ago, um, there was, this is a five foot long bathtub. We used, there was a drain in the floor uh, where the water could be put into uh, because there is a drainage system in this palace. There is, um, you can see the blue lines. Um, there, is, there are um, pipes that bring the water in, and then there are pipes that bring the waste out. There is a toilet, kind of think outhouse, uh, a hole, uh, and there is constant water going through there. 
So there is a natural flushing system, which is taking all of the waste out, takes it out into the, takes it far out into the field where it gets dumped. Um, we here are some of these pipes, and we find this drainage system not just in the palace, but we find this in the homes of ordinary people. So it looks like we have again four thousand years ago people with water system being brought into the house. Now they have traced the, the source of the water back to a spring up in the mountains. There, because of the earthquake, the, the spring has moved some, but they have poured water in to where they've found it up in the, 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 oh, the start of this drainage system and water system. They've poured water in and it comes right down in and runs through. So, but what about this myth here? Okay, yeah, that palace sort of looks like a labyrinth and okay. One of the things we know is that this, this is called the house of the double axe and we see this double axe everywhere. We see it in gold. Okay? You're not gonna cut anybody with that. We see it carved into stone. We see it on pottery. And we know that the Greek word for double axe it's labyrinth. Labyrinth, maze, hmm, maybe. We find these, these double axes, they're found everywhere. And again, in gold and silver, you're not going to actually use those in battle. They're absolutely decorative. We see them in um, depictions of, uh, this is a ring. And one of the things that's really interesting is the number of places that women are depicted in frescoes, in jewelry. Women seem to be all over the place, um, which of course leads people, you know, what is the role of women uh, in this society? Uh, they're certainly not, they are, they are as depicted in art as much if not more than the men are. Um, here are some pieces, some frescoes. Um, this woman is known as the Parisian because of her makeup. Uh, obviously, they've got makeup, they've got jewels. Um, we've got all of, you know, lots and lots of women. And one of the things that's really interesting is that women are always viewed with white skin. Men are with orangey skin, and that's what the Egyptians did. So they learned a few things from the Egyptians. So here we are with the women, the double ax in the background, which is obviously a symbol of the government. And we've got these three women. Mm, is there some meaning to all of that? We also find bull. Here is a necklace with a bull's head on it. Bull, of course, is a very masculine symbol. There's another bull that we see. The palace is decorated with these stones. This is not a reproduction. This is how it was. And these were found all around the palace. They lined the roof. They are obviously, you know, the bullhorn is protecting them somehow. How does that fit in with the myth? And then we have this. We have bull leaping. And this is obviously something that they did. This is a ring. Um, and we've got a person doing acrobatics on the back of a bull. And this is perhaps the most famous fresco. We have two women. We have a man. We have one woman holding on to the bull's horn, and she's getting ready to flip herself over, land on the back. Here's somebody spotting here. And you begin to look at this and say, oh, hmm. If this is a sport that they wanted to do, um, you'd probably have to start training someone to do this when they were pretty young. Probably not going to start this when you're, you know, 17 or 18 years old. If we look at our gymnasts today, because this is really gymnastics, if we look at our gymnasts today, the really good gymnasts really start training when they're four, five, six, seven years old. So, you know, would you want your children to do this job? 
okay? This has got to be a little bit dangerous. So could it be that the Minoans, because of their trade, borrowed, took, demanded other people's young children, take them when they're four or five, don't take them when they're 15 or 16, take them when they're young, train them to be believers. I don't know how long your career would be. I mean, some would be fairly short, but if you were really good, you might stay good till you're in your 20s and then you'd retire. Are you going to go back home to Athens or Corinth or someplace else? Or are you going to stay in the place where you've been for 15 years? Um, so is there some sort of, hmm, something about this with the bull? And let's look at this, this courtyard. This would be used for religious festivals. And one of the things, this is a big area. Um, again, it's about a quarter of a football field. And could you have a ruler who would be standing there giving instructions? Um, and one of the things we all we know is that frequently masks were used to help people project their voice. And if Crete is the birthplace of Zeus and uh, the bull is a symbol of Zeus, could you have a ruler who might wear a bull's mask. And if you were a foreigner visiting and you come and you see this palace, you try to find your way. I mean, you can find, you can go online and find copies of this. You know, you, you start, if you look at it as kind of a maze, I mean, how can you get it from one place to another? It really is very difficult and know that you've got about three levels down and three to four levels up. So you've got like seven levels in this palace. It would be really easy to get lost. So, and when they go home and they tell these stories, um, do they get exaggerated? Um, and um, so maybe there's some truth here. So here is this, this picture uh, of what we think uh, the palace may have looked like. We, we know that there is a goddess, um, you know, she's got a dove, she's got snakes. Um, um, we, this is my favorite piece of art. Um, it's actually a, a coffin. Yeah, well, I just, I, I look at this and I have lots of questions. First of all, I love the swirlies. Um, We've got um, the double axe over here. We've got some sort of ceremony. This is a tomb over here. This is the guy, this is probably the guy who is dead. Uh, he has no arms. So that, you know, probably that he's dead. And we've got people, come, men, bunch of men coming with cat, uh, two cows and a boat making sacrifices. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in is this guy right here, um, because he's dressed as a woman. Uh, it's a he, unless he got the colors wrong. And yet, and here we have a woman who's dressed more like the men. Very interesting, lots of questions. So here's a close up of that. We have tons and tons of questions and we can't answer them because all we have is archeological evidence. We have writing, we have lots of writing. We have actually two kinds of writing. One is linear A and one is linear B. Linear B is later and it's Greek and we can read it. And it turns out it's sort of shopping lists. It would be like going through my purse and pulling out the CVS receipts and trying to figure out my life from the CVS receipts. Um, you know, it'd be a little strange. But this is the writing we have the most, and this is what we call linear A, and we can't read it. Uh, although they keep claiming they're working at it, um, we don't know if this is a word or if this is a sentence. I see a baseball glove here. I don't think they had baseball gloves. Um, here I've got a man and I've got a fish. 
So was the man fishing? Here's a slice of pizza. This is a fire hydrant. Um, we've got a bunch of fire hydrants. Here's another running man with a flower. Here I've got two fire hydrants. And look here, I've got a guy with a mohawk. Okay, I don't know who that is. So we're trying to figure out, we don't think these people spoke Greek. So because we don't know the language and we haven't found anything that has both linear A and linear B on it that we can translate, we can't read this. And so all we have is archeological evidence and guesses. So here's linear B and we can translate this. And as I said, they're shopping lists. And the question you might wanna ask is what happened? Well, one of the theories is, has to do with this island up here, the island of Santorini. And the island of Santorini is, it's either the same civilization or it's a different civilization. Their lifestyle is very much the same. Um, and this is the island of Santorini, but at one point this was all whole. This whole center part was once, is the caldera of a volcano. This volcano blew its top. And when it blew its top, um, it, just, it covered up the, civil, the cities on this island. Um, and the guy who began to excavate this um, talks about how important excavation is. This is what we see when we, um, this has been covered with ash. And when we go in, here the wood has been preserved. Nothing has been reconstructed. And you can see that it's very similar to what Arthur Evans did. Um, so um, this is the city of Thera. Um, and they barely scratched the surf of this and they keep running out of money and it's closed down most of the time. But you see that you, we've got streets, we've got houses along the streets, we've got narrow streets. Um, and so this is what we think Gnosis would have looked like. Uh, there could have been a palace here, we just haven't excavated here. Um, this is a wooden table that was uh, covered with lime. The wood is now gone, but the lime has kept the form of the table. Um, you know, that could go, if you th thought about that in wood, that could go in a house today. We found bulls there. Um, but the island of Santorini, you can see um, that you've got all of these layers of volcanic ash. There's just, you know, because when you go in, when you sail in, which is the way most people go, you're sailing right into the caldera or the center of the volcanic. Um, when you go, you can see the, all the layers, you can see the, the road here, that's a little tricky. Um, the ships that come into this harbor cannot anchor. No one has an anchor chain long enough so that they can hit the bottom. Um, and so the ships that come in, um, when you come in on your cruise ship or whatever, if you're, if you, unless you're small enough to come into a dock, your ship basically um, keeps the motor on low and keeps going in circles around the center. So this was, um, all of this originally was one island. And the, the idea is that it's being talked about is that maybe this island created such, this explosion created such a tidal wave that it destroyed the, 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 the um, uh, fleet of the Minoans. Um, we do know that um, there was damage at Gnosis. There was some rebuilding that wasn't very good. But at the same time this is happening, Mycenae is coming to power and Mycenae is very different. Look at the size of that wall. That is a normal size man. And that wall, Mycenae is fortified. It is defensive. That is not a palace with gentle swirlies. That is someplace that is going to keep the enemy out. And this is the doorway that leads into that. It's going to keep the enemy out. Um, and so, you know, I actually am a believer that um, I agree with Schliemann and with um, Arthur Evans 
that frequently those stories, there is a grain of truth in them. Um, uh, do I believe a bull came out of the sea? No. Um, but do I believe that those stories get bent and twisted and um, uh, turned into nice legends? Yeah, I do. So there you go.